Michael Skaggs, Dr. Michael Skaggs, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. I very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to join you and to talk a little bit about the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab. Uh, you mentioned that you're going to post this on YouTube, so I'm just, I'll say we're on YouTube as well. <clears throat> so a lot of the things that we talk about here uh, will have some sort of connection to one video or other that we've put up there. So uh, I would strongly encourage you to go check us out. Uh, we are we are there. So as Robert mentioned, my name is Michael Skaggs. Uh, I am Director of Programs for the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab, and I've been here since the beginning. Uh, we launched in the fall of 2018, um, and we've been doing uh, really interesting work ever since then. Um, we grew out of this collaboration that uh, that Wendy Cadge and I had, and that she was bringing a lot of other experiences. Well, we met <clears throat> working on a project that had to do with uh, chaplains that work in seaports uh, for another organization that I was working with. And as we talked more and more, and she continued the conversation with other colleagues, um, it became really obvious that we had an opportunity here to bring chaplains together in a way that hadn't been done before, uh, because we saw that lots of chaplains were, were doing really good work, but they weren't connecting with each other, especially with chaplains who weren't working in the same areas. We were really concerned to sort of cross fertilize the various sectors of chaplaincy so that we could see a little bit more commonality and that folks could really uh, benefit from the work that was being done <clears throat> in other areas that they might not have um, a whole lot of direct experience in. So that is kind of the origin of the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab. And I'm just going to walk you through some of the things that we are actually doing today that you can take advantage of, that I would uh, you know, recommend that you might send on to your colleagues. There's lots to explore, and I'm just going to walk you through some of those things, and I'm sure that um, at least something here uh, will be of interest. So let me share my screen, <clears throat> and I'll show you some of our resources. So the first thing that I want to mention is our program of webinars. All of our webinars are free. They're open for anyone to join. Um, and we have a schedule of upcoming webinars. You can see everything that we have that is um, definitely on the books that we have a registration link for. We have lots of things that are always in the works, but anything that we have ready to go is here on the website and you can register right here as well. And then you get lots of reminders and all of that sort of thing. So once you register, you're taken care of there. We also archive all of our webinars, uh, both on YouTube, and then that is also embedded in our website here as well. So you, anyone can go back and watch any of our webinars from, from any point, really. Uh, and this is especially useful for folks who may have to leave an event early or they come late or something comes up or whatever. People can always go back and watch them. So this is always available. We don't attach any formal credit to our webinars. We don't have accreditation to offer CEUs or anything like that in the United States. But a lot of people do use them as part of their continuing education. They may belong to an institution that will accept attendance at one of these for you know, one hour of continuing ed. So we do have a lot of people that participate that way as well. I want to connect, uh, I want to mention one of our colleague organizations here, Transforming Chaplaincy. This is something that, uh, that Wendy launched with George Fichette back in 2015, I think. I came on a little bit later, but Transforming Chaplaincy is really the premier organization for uh, research and healthcare chaplaincy. And so for those of you who are working in healthcare, and I suspect if, if the Canadian demographic looks like the American demographic, it's probably most of you that are working in healthcare, uh, but if you have not connected with Transforming Chaplaincy yet, I would strongly encourage you to do so. They do really great work on healthcare chaplaincy and especially research, whether that's presenting things that have been produced or helping folks become research literate and conduct projects themselves. It's a really great organization, so I encourage you to check that out as well. The Chaplaincy Innovation Lab does conduct a lot of its own uh, research as well. We have any number of research projects underway uh, at a given point. I just want to show off one project here. This is one of our very earliest ones. We did a study of how students uh, take advantage of chaplains on university campuses. So we surveyed a small liberal arts college in New England to see how students engage in spiritual life there and came up with some really interesting results. We saw, you know, how many students engage, why they engage, why they don't engage, 
uh, how their own religious identity or spiritual identity might impact that engagement. And so this is just one very small example, uh, but this is the type of research that we do. We are, all, almost all of us in the lab are academics by training. And so we live very comfortably in that world of pure research, but we always have an eye towards application. We don't necessarily make policy recommendations or say, and this is the absolute next thing that should be done, but we do want our research to show this is where there are weaknesses, this is where there are strengths. And for people who are in positions to influence chaplaincy in their institutions, wherever they are, we want them to have this information uh, to, to be able to improve the services that are being provided. Now, along those same lines of improving the world of spiritual care, we also offer what we call our field guide series for aspiring chaplains. This grew out of a lot of contact that we were getting from people who were interested in spiritual care as a career or a vocation, depending on how they think of it, and they just didn't know where to start. And we were very, we are very aware of the fact that chaplaincy is not an easy world to break into if you're not familiar with it, especially depending on where you might be located in terms of faith tradition, your socioeconomic status, your educational status. It can be really difficult to break into that field. You know, we realized that when we talk about things like CPE, certification, endorsement. If you aren't already in the chaplaincy world, just terms like that represent real barriers because it's not obvious what that means. And so we launched the field guide series as a way to bring people in and offer really fundamental foundational information so that folks can make informed decisions about where to go next. So we have lots of sessions. Uh, this season, we happen to be doing sort of a series that focuses on specific sectors of chaplaincy. So the very first one we had this year in January was on community chaplaincy, social justice movement chaplaincy. Uh, the one we just did earlier this month was on higher education chaplaincy. So there is always something here for everybody. For people who don't know where to get started, we try to offer really entry-level information uh, and direct contact uh, with people who are doing leading work in these fields. This is a real opportunity for folks to have one-on-one, -on -one, I shouldn't say one-on-one, -on -one, but small group discussion with people who are leaders in the country in these areas of chaplaincy. And so it's a real opportunity and we're really happy to offer that. I would really encourage you to share this with students that you might know. Uh, anyone who is interested in chaplaincy as a career, we have folks who are you know, just finishing up college and thinking about divinity school. We have people who have retired and are thinking about a second career. So in everybody in between. So the field guide series really has something to offer uh, everybody. We also offer a lot of other resources that we try to categorize in ways that are useful. And we have done this in a way that is responsive to what people have asked us for. So let me just drop this menu down right here uh, that shows the variety of resources that we offer. Uh, 21st Century Spiritual Care refers to the textbook that we're pr uh, producing that's going to come out from the University of North Carolina Press in May. That was produced in partnership with Boston University uh, School of Theology with a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation. Uh, and it really will be a, a landmark foundational text for the field that's going to introduce a lot of new people to spiritual care. We offer a series of four case studies that anyone can use in the classroom or any chaplain can work through themselves. They're interactive. They each take about 30 minutes to, uh, to go through. I'll just click the link. I don't know why I haven't yet. Uh, and so we talk about, well, what does it mean for a patient to be having what they think is a healing experience, but a healthcare practitioner might say they're hallucinating. Uh, we have a case study on higher education chaplaincy. We have a case study on, uh, on chaplaincy for people who are living on the streets who are experiencing homelessness and what it means to make meaning for them who are in very difficult circumstances. And then finally, we have a case study that has to do with how chaplains can navigate policy in their own identity in institutions. It's a very practically minded uh, case study that can help folks uh, wherever they may be. Again, these are free, they're easily accessible. Anybody can come in here and use them and we really encourage people to do that. Another one of the resources that we offer that is really growing over the past year or so is our series of eBooks. And again, like everything else, uh, these are all free. We encourage anybody to check them out. 
I'll give you a quick overview of what we offer right now, but the catalog is always growing. We have a number of them in the works right now. Uh, this one here by Suyan Pak and Zachary Moon uh, is specifically about setting up uh, educational programs for chaplaincy in theological schools. It comes out of our growing network with institutions that offer varying types of chaplaincy degrees, uh, all the way from you know, the classic MDiv, in some cases a DMIN, to just a certificate, or maybe like a subspecialization in an MDiv. So this ebook is catered towards how can you sort of beef up those programs to where to make sure that your graduates are as well prepared as possible when they hit the job market. Uh, or if you don't have a chaplaincy program in your school and you'd like to start one, here are some things that you should be considering along the way. We offer a beginner's guide to clinical pastoral education that was written by McCall Springer, uh, a very close colleague in New York. And this is a really great way to introduce people to the really complex world of CPE. Uh, it answers questions like, how do I pick a center? How do I figure out who my supervisor should be? How much is this going to cost? Can I afford it? How many units should I do? So all these questions that students tend to have, uh, they can start here. We did a project with the Fetzer Institute based in Kalamazoo, Michigan last year that was based around conversation circles for chaplains of color and the experiences that they have had in the past and are having in their work. And so we produced this ebook, which is on conversation circles as a model, as kind of an intervention for support for chaplains. Everything we do, uh, we want people to be able to both learn from it directly, but also be able to model it and do it again in their own institutions. And so the Conversation Circle uh, ebook is a good example of that. Here's how it works, here's how it uh, is set up and how it can be beneficial in different places. We have an ebook on student mental health and spirit spirituality. Uh, we conducted a project at Brandeis University and Northeastern University uh, that basically brought together a chaplain and a mental health counselor to do facilitated conversations with students. And this was a space where students could talk about their concerns that incorporated both their spirituality and aspects of mental health. Um, I don't know exactly the cultural situation in Canada, but at least here in the United States, these are two different conversations that typically happen separately from one another. And they don't always inform each other in ways that are helpful. And in some ways they're even antagonistic uh, with, with either side being a little bit suspicious of the other. We don't believe in that separation uh, in the lab. And so we brought together a chaplain and a counselor where students could talk about their spirituality and mental health concerns in the same place. And the students found that to be enormously helpful, uh, especially for those who you know, had, had either entered uh, university or were trying to finish university during the pandemic. These ended up being really helpful as well. The Beginner's Guide to Spiritual Care is, is one of the resources that I send out to people the most because it really is a beginner's guide for people that don't know anything about chaplaincy other than maybe they know one or they've heard of one and they like to explore this kind of work. We'll send them the beginner's guide to spiritual care and that, give, that gives them a place to get started. There's a wonderful book here on trauma and moral injury. Um, I know just from recent correspondence that this is being used in various educational programs. It's a great way for chaplains in a variety of settings uh, to understand trauma and moral injury better and how they can help address that. And then finally, uh, we have down here, uh, the last one that I'll mention because I'm conscious of the time, uh, what we call meditations on chaplaincy and spiritual care. That is basically, we brought together a group of chaplains at the Fetzer Institute in 2019 to, to lay out the status of the field. What are the concerns of chaplains? Where are maybe some of the weaknesses in education and training? Where is their demand for spiritual care that's not being met? And so it is very much a series of meditations. It is not intended to be a guide. It is not intended to be put to literal use, but it is a series of leading chaplains in the United States uh, kind of thinking out loud about the field and where we might go from here. We have a number of resources that are catered to specifically to certain types of chaplains, certain groups of chaplains. So we have one down here we call it by faith tradition, and I know it's dropping down off the screen there. This is a small screen, uh, but it offers plenty of resources on areas like Buddhist chaplaincy, Hindu chaplaincy, humanist chaplaincy. We offer this not because we're so concerned to sort of categorize these things and everything has to be separate. That's not it at all. Uh, but we are very aware of the fact that, again, at least in the United States, chaplaincy 
has a very Christian history, uh, specifically a very Protestant history. And so for either chaplains who are coming from these different traditions or chaplains who are serving people in these traditions, this is something that there needs to be more resources dedicated specifically to those traditions so that chaplains can take uh, acknowledgement of what is unique about those needs and put them into practice. Um, most, if not all professional chaplains are very well aware of cultural differences and they wanna serve everybody no matter who they are, but they might not always have the knowledge to do that. And so we wanna help overcome some of that barrier. We also have this section that is called by sector, which breaks down to areas like airports, corrections, the military, higher education, that achieve some of the same aims as the resources by faith tradition. A lot of chaplains, uh, you know, in their educational programs and their CPE experiences, they will get a lot of baseline skills, a lot of baseline knowledge, and that's wonderful. But just like with different faith traditions, there are different needs in every sector. And so for chaplains who are just getting started, maybe considering a career change and moving to another sector, we wanna help them make that transition to see what are the, the skills that are common between one and the other, and what is unique and what needs to be learned from one place to the next. We're also very concerned to support spiritual care educators. And so we have a, what we call a lib guide that is, at, uh, that is based at uh, Boston University School of Theology that is intended to be a database of resources for educators to use as they create, uh, create courses, revise courses, what have you. This contains all of the current research, lots of primary sources. Essentially, if you are an educator and you wanna get started, this is the place to go. Um, and so some of you may be uh, teaching in, in various capacities. And so I would encourage you to check that out. We also like to bring people together in a variety of ways that, that are helpful. And so I'll, I'll give you an example here of a, a project that is just sort of wrapping up right now. It was specifically focused on chaplains who are working in the state of New Jersey. And that's because the funder is in New Jersey and wants to support institutions there. We call it Caring for Interfaith Caregivers. And essentially, we created a series of supportive con uh, conversation circles for chaplains in New Jersey. They met four times. Uh, these are sort of safe, generative, um, compassionate spaces where chaplains can come and discuss their experiences. Um, we, we got these going right as the Omicron wave was kind of ramping up. And so I think that probably dominated a lot of those discussions, but this is just one way that we bring chaplains together. Uh, again, this is a way that was responsive. We knew that chaplains wanted help with networking. We knew that chaplains wanted a greater sense of community. This is a great way that we were able to do that. Uh, we also have a job postings page, and I, I'm not going to click over there because I know for right now we don't happen to have any that are active. Um, but people come to us all the time because their institution is hiring uh, chaplains, and so we're happy to post them here as well. All of that goes out through our newsletter, our social media, and so we try to help institutions get as many high quality candidates as possible. It's a great resource for job seekers as well. Let me circle back around quickly to some of the resources that we have for educators, for those of you who might be in a position to, uh, to, to be in the classroom. We call this sort of informally our backpack of, of tools for educators, and it's intended to be kind of a one-stop kit where there's a little bit of something here for everybody, no matter what kind of institution you're in, what kind of programs are being offered. So the first thing here is our forthcoming textbook. That's gonna be out in May. You can pre-order it now, so I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, we have a fact sheet that is just sort of an overview of the state of contemporary chaplaincy, including uh, what the employment landscape looks like, uh, what types of needs chaplains to be, need to be able to serve. And so this is especially useful for folks who might be trying to get uh, an educational program started in their institution, because this really points up the need for chaplains uh, in contemporary society. Here again are the case studies. We have a collection of syllabi here that are available for folks to adapt as they please. Um, it would be nice if you could attribute sort of where you got the idea, but in any case, uh, there are a series of syllabi here for spiritual care courses that people offer in various institutions. We have an entire series of resources here that has to do with chaplains of color, which can be used either by those chaplains or anyone who's teaching around these areas. Uh, this includes 
the report on the conversation circles model. It includes an entire online reader on the history of chaplains of color and some of the, uh, the important works that people should be considering. And then we also have a working paper on the history and the present state of, chapl of chaplaincy for people of color with some recommendations moving forward. This is a really interesting video series that we have that is from a group of people who are in positions of hiring chaplains at kind of a high level. And so we interviewed these people and said, what do you need of chaplains? What should they know as they're coming out of school? Or what do you wish that schools would train more on as chaplains are in them? And so I would encourage you to check out this entire series. It includes a number of sectors um, so that there is a, a good sense of the different needs of different uh, sectors of chaplaincy. But this is kind of straight from the horse's mouth for people who are hiring chaplains, here's what we wanna see. And so we find that to be really helpful for educators. Again, here's a link to the ebook series. Uh, here's a link to the webinar series, which includes a lot that is of interest to educators. And then finally, we also encourage people to send students to our uh, field guide series. Again, it's open to anybody and we encourage lots of students to come. They end up having some really great conversations there. I would also encourage you, if you're not already uh, on the list, sign up for our newsletter. It's the easiest way to stay informed on everything that we're doing. And I, I'm fairly confident that we have a lot of people, or at least a number of people, uh, in the Canadian Association of Spiritual Care who are uh, members of our community. But if you're not, I would encourage you to do so. We don't send out a lot of email, but this is the way to keep in touch with any of the events that we're hosting, partner events, grant opportunities, anything that we think might be of interest of chaplains. We stick it in the newsletter. We try to keep it brief, but we also try to keep it comprehensive so it has something of interest to everyone. I want to circle around quickly uh, again to our forthcoming textbook. This is really a landmark project. This was an enormous project because we brought together a, a, a really big list of leading lights in spiritual care to, to compile the chapters for this book. Um, it is available for pre-order now. I would encourage you to do that. We're doing a drawing right now for free copies. Uh, and so you can click the link there and that will uh, allow you to enter it. But I really encourage you to keep an eye out for that because we think this is gonna be a really important contribution uh, to the field. So let me just stop sharing my screen. So that is kind of an overview of what the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab offers, what we are doing right now. We're doing plenty more besides that, but these are kind of the most, um, uh, the most public facing things that we find that a lot of people have a lot of interest in. I wanna talk just briefly about what we see as priorities in the field of spiritual care today. And then I'm happy to turn it back uh, to Robert and we can proceed uh, as you would like. So for one, we know that the concept of being spiritual but not religious, that's the phrase you always hear, or humanist, um, this is among the most important priorities that chaplains should have in mind now and for the foreseeable future. Uh, this is especially challenging because even for chaplains who have a lot of training in serving people from outside of their own tradition, the language, the fundamentals of spiritual care, kind of the groundwork of the education, a lot of times still presumes some sort of self-identification, some sort of institutional religion that in many cases is not recognizable to care seekers. Those categories are spiritual but not religious, humanist, atheist, agnostic, whatever. We know that the demographic trend is on the rise. And so chaplains really need to be aware of that and train themselves to serve those people now and in the future. We hope to see more community chaplaincy and chaplaincy in workplaces, because this is where people who are not otherwise in some sort of institutional setting, uh, like a hospital or the military or in higher education, this is where they are. And if they're going to have contact with a chaplain, a chaplain's going to have to go to them because otherwise it's not going to happen. Uh, an increase in these forms of chaplaincy, we think, is going to let more people avail themselves of spiritual care. We think the field also needs to be more aware of different and varied paths into the work. For a lot of people, uh, graduate education, multiple units of CPE, things like certification, it just remains out of reach. Uh, in other areas, and we've identified this especially for chaplains of color, there are what we call leaks in the pipeline between education to work to leadership. We see people falling out as they transition or they, they, they don't transition from one stage to the next. And so that pipeline needs to be strengthened. 
We need to, we need to make it easier to, to become a chaplain with meaningful training, as well as foster staying in the career and advancing it. Uh, we're keen to promote chaplains of color and leadership, as well as cohort focused programs that will build community, especially when many chaplains of color serve as what we all often hear as the only in, in, their, in their institutions and very isolated, uh, which introduces an entire host of problems. Uh, in the US, chaplaincy is definitely distinct from psychotherapy, um, although there is at least one organization that, that understands CPE as being part of pastoral counseling and kind of combines the two. And so the professionalization question is a live one in the United States, and it's very complicated. Uh, more licensure and official status for chaplains might make it easier to be known and explain what it is that chaplains do, but it also would bring with it an element of oversight that a lot of chaplains don't want. Um, and in some ways we have to wonder if there is this sort of external governmental organization defining what a chaplain is, what does that mean for the work? What does that mean for the training? But in any case, uh, dealing with that question of being spiritual but not religious will help us deal with that. Um, if good answers and good practices can be developed in addressing that community that aren't therapy, because that's what we hear all the time, then you can prevent some of that drift towards psychotherapy as spiritual care. Um, and the same applies for, for the communities that are humanist, agnostic, however they might want to describe themselves. So these are some of the priorities that we see. Of course, there are many of the things that can be discussed, but Robert, I'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It's uh, very informative and uh, wow, it's just so impressive what you're doing there and how it's all organized on the website. And it's uh, a huge resource, uh, what uh, our members have been asking us for in many ways to have that kind of collection of resources all in one place. And you've highlighted so many topics that are of interest to, I know many of our uh, members on the line today, we have educators and our executive director, I believe is on the line and uh, folks from the ethics commission. So all kinds of perspectives and uh, questions you've raised, I'm sure. And I'd like to open it up to to uh, anyone who would like to ask a question of, of Michael. Also that last topic, I mean, the merging of psych, uh, psychotherapy and spiritual care is something we're really wrestling with now in, in Ontario where we're uh, many, uh, most of us are, are registered members of the um, College of Registered Psychotherapists of Ontario and that's a entry to practice and is that competing with um, certification, you know, and uh, causing, I think, real distress, real confusion in our region. So anyway, over to any other questions, please go ahead. So Rebecca. Thank you. Um, I just want to maybe make more of a comment than any question. I just want to say thank you so much for your presentation, Michael, and especially this last point um, that's being touched on in terms of the drift towards psychotherapy. I think maintaining the integrity of a, a foundational um, and very formative discipline has been um, a challenge, I would say, uh, based on the trends that have been occurring. Um, and so maybe I can turn this into a question. Um, how do you see ensuring that integrity um, uh, in terms of preventing that drift towards psychotherapy as kind of circumventing or, or transforming spiritual care into something also valuable, but something very different from where it began? Uh, began? I don't know if that made sense as a question for you. I hope. Yeah, that absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think that the key task here is to abstract spirituality out of religion, capital R. Um, and here's why I say that. At least in the United States, the vast majority of chaplains come out of a religious tradition. Um, and in fact, it is a really high priority that those chaplains be very well grounded in that tradition. Because what we don't want is chaplains who are out operating, who are trying to figure out their own spirituality and having some sort of crisis, even while they're trying to help somebody else. So they do need to be very well grounded in their own tradition. We do see a lot of increased expertise of chaplains being able to help folks who are not from their own tradition. I mean, in fact, this is just understood to be part of the job now. Um, a, a professional chaplain now wouldn't dream of only serving people in their own, you know, sort of their own context. But I think that there is still a real struggle to acknowledge what does spirituality look like outside of that? In some ways, this is a generational question. And it really applies, especially to things like humanism. 
because that's a, that's a difficult conversation. And we're aware in the United States that even a term like chaplain is really heavily loaded. People hear it, and for a lot of folks, they shut down because they think this means clergy person who's going to come dispense sacraments at me or want to pray with me or whatever. And that just shuts the conversation down. And so we're very well aware of that. Developing an approach to spirituality that is not religious or developing an approach to meaning making that is not even spiritual, figuring out what that means for chaplains, I think, is one way of addressing that drift to psychotherapy. And the reason I say that is that, let's say I'm a humanist and I'm experiencing some sort of crisis and a chaplain says that they're you know, available for me to talk to. My immediate reaction is gonna be, I'm gonna to go to a therapist. What are you offering me, right? Um, you know, you're gonna actively listen to me. Okay, a therapist can do that. Um, you're gonna be compassionate for me. Okay, a therapist can do that. Chaplains do something different. What that means for people who are spiritual but not religious, or not spiritual and not religious, that's the difference. Um, so it's not a clear answer, and I'm sorry, but I think the answer is that this is a process that has to be engaged consciously and intensively for now into the foreseeable future. I appreciate that, and I agree. It's it's not a clear not a clear question. It's not a clear answer. But for me, it's always been about educating people, um, and I'll. I'll leave this to go to someone else who's got their hand up shortly but just to say I've been a chaplaincy in chaplaincy for 20 plus years and it's always raised the question like what is a chaplain you don't look like a chaplain I didn't know chaplains did what you do people are transformed by being informed so yeah. uh, so just thank you so much for for um for doing what you do I'll just make a follow-up point and it kind of illustrates this and, and certainly I want to move on um but you may recall a couple of months ago when the uh, Harvard University, the, the president of their Chaplains Association is a, is a humanist. Um, and in the US, at least, this was sort of a minor uproar. How is this possible? How can a humanist be a chaplain and be in charge of all the other religious chaplains? How could this possibly be? Well, if you don't really understand what a modern professional chaplain is, then of course that makes no sense. But if you do understand what that is, then you realize that that's not a problem at all. It's not contradictory at all. Uh, but in some ways, and, and you know, I would, even though I'm not a chaplain myself, I'm including myself as part of this problem, we haven't done a good job of translating that. We haven't done a good job of communicating what it is that chaplains do and who they are for various people. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> I believe uh, Fritz Clark had a question and then Dan Moulton. Okay, Dan, go ahead. Hi, right, thank you, Michael, for the, um, when you're talking about the humanists, I know in Canada, it's very similar to the States, I think, almost 30% in rising. Um, and that's, uh, we're seeing more here at the hospital too. And it's interesting, the role of chaplains, and I agree with that term, uh, people kind of react to it. Um, me and Robert last, I think over the last week, we're trying to reach out in the States. I'm not sure if you heard of the uh, the clergy project. Have you ever been in contact with them? I, I may have, but so many things come across our radar. I, it doesn't so, stand so, out at the moment. <laughs> so, so the clergy project is interesting. It's a support group for ex-clergy or active clergy that are atheists now. Hmm. About a thousand of them. And uh, re we reached out. It was very interesting because it seems that, and I'm wondering with the the rise of people who say identify as humanists, even the word spiritual, because they seem to throw out, I'm not sure if there's a hurt, but they not only throw out the religion, but even terms like spirituality and all this is kind of almost like a taboo to talk about. That was our feeling when we were communicating with them. Yeah. Um, but it'd be interesting if there's research done to find out what's the language needed so as chaplains we could connect. Yeah, and I think that this, this is really an exercise in getting back to that fundamental task of meeting people where they are. Uh, yep. And I don't, I don't say that just as, you know, to sort of say a, a trite phrase, um, but I understand well that, um, you know, some people, for some people, 
the concept of spirituality is not something they want to be involved in because this this entails to them some sort of transcendence that does not exist, right? Uh, and so here I fall back on that question of meaning making, um, so that a, a chaplain would have an encounter, and you know, of course, you're going to have to have it's going to work up to this. But how do we make meaning for you? This is the important part. You know, it doesn't matter to the chaplain whether you believe in a higher power in anything transcendent whatsoever. What is, what is meaningful to you? And I think a lot of chaplains are, are, are sort of getting around this. Um, and I think especially, I'm thinking especially in, in examples in healthcare institutions where chaplains won't even introduce themselves as chaplains. They'll stop by a patient room and say, I'm so-and-so from the spiritual care department. I just wanna see how you're doing. And one thing leads to another. Um, but it is really difficult. And, you know, in, in a perfect world, you can imagine where you would come to the door and you get five minutes to explain who you are and what you do to make sure that they know that you're there to support them and not evangelize or whatever, but that's not realistic. Um, so I think there, there are a lot of creative ways that people are getting around it. But again, this is a task that it, it's, it's incumbent on us to do as, as a field, explaining what it is that chaplains do and who their work applies to, which is everybody. Thank, uh, thank you for that, I agree. It's, uh, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Fritz, go ahead. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Fritz, are you there? Go ahead. Okay, maybe he'll come back. Any other questions? Anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask Michael? Oh, oh there. Fritz might still be there. Fritz, <laughs> Fritz come in. Maybe an internet connection problem. Put a question or a suggestion to Fritz to put his question in the chat. Fritz, if you're able okay. to do that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, I was. I had two devices going. I just want to uh, thank Michael because Michael has helped me with uh, research um, and everyone at the uh, Innovation Lab. Um, but I want to uh, just pose a question. Um, how do you see the role, um, especially of providing research materials for um, we do a lot of staff education, and I know that's something that the Innovation Lab has been really good on. How do you see that going forward? Really, it depends on what the needs are uh, of the organization or the individual doing the staff education. In some cases, we have resources that are ready to go, and we're very happy to say, take this, please give us you know, a mention as you're doing it, but by all means, go with it. Um, there, someone recently uh, contacted me about that ebook that I mentioned, The Trauma and Moral Injury. And this person said, I want to develop a presentation and I want to use this as the baseline. How do I do that? And we were very happy to work with her and say, yes, by all means, please acknowledge us. Please acknowledge the original uh, foundation funder, but use this. Uh, and so she was able to give a presentation to healthcare staff, including physicians, nurses, other chaplains on what it is to see and recognize uh, trauma and moral injury in patients. So in some cases, we have ready-made solutions that we were happy to hand over. Uh, in other cases, we do a lot of networking. And so that is one thing that I, I failed to mention earlier. But if you are looking for something and you don't see it on our website, reach out to me. Uh, and either I can help you locate it because maybe we haven't done a great job of, of bringing it up to the top, or I can connect you with someone who is doing that type of work. And we'll get that going as well. So we do a lot of networking to make sure that whatever people need, even if we can't give it to them directly, we can get them started uh, on the path to doing that. Uh, now, what I will say is that depending on the type of education that you want to do, for things that are more extensive, of course, this requires a, a significant amount of resources. It requires staff time on your part. Um, it, it can require time on our part. But you know, we always tell people, if you would like to go and apply for a grant and partner with us on carrying out that work, we're happy to do it. Um, it's just one of those things where 
I have a lot of conversations where folks have great ideas. And so we'll talk for half an hour and then they have a better idea of where to go next and they go and work on it. And, you know, sometimes I hear from them six months later and they're ready to do a project. And other times I never hear from them again. Um, but all of which is to say, we're always open for conversation. And so whatever you'd like to accomplish, get in touch and we'll figure out a way to, to proceed. Great. I, I know there's lots of other questions out there. I'm just going to throw out a couple topics for you. Wondering about what resources you might have or how you're thinking about uh, topics like burnout for chaplains, moral distress, uh, compassion fatigue, and burnout, especially in the times that we're in now. And also wondering about psychedelics and the role of spiritual care yeah. in, let's say, uh, psilocybin and palliative care and wondering what's on your radar for those sure. two topics. Yeah, so there are a number of resources on the website now, uh, especially if you type for uh, if you if you type in the phrase "caring for caregivers" or "caring for those who care." Um, all of that will encompass everything that we've done that has to do with chaplains specifically. We really launched those efforts in earnest right when the pandemic broke out. Um, I can remember distinctly; it was uh, March seventeenth. It was St. Patrick's Day in the United States or well, everywhere, but. Um, I remember it being St. Patrick's Day. We had the first Caring for the Caregiver webinar, and the room was just overflowing because the pandemic had really blown up at that point, and chaplains were coming to us saying, I have no idea what to do. Completely overwhelmed. We have no protocols. Um, either, you know, I don't feel safe at work, or I can't reach patients. I can't reach families. Everyone was just sort of freaking out. And so we launched this series, Caring for the Caregiver. We, we, we brought in folks that um, could do a lot of things like helping chaplains with basic techniques to cope with turnout, uh, burnout rather, uh, lots of ways that chaplains could practically work on this. There's an ebook as well, uh, Caring for Those Who Care, that has to do with how chaplains can work with uh, healthcare staff uh, on some of these same issues as well. But we are very well aware that the topic of burnout is, is a top priority for everybody. Oddly enough, though, one of the biggest challenges that we come across, and this is, this is actually, it's understandable if you think about it, but for us to put together resources on burnout means that we have to rely on leading chaplains in the United States. And guess what? Those folks are burnt out. So for me to come along and say, hey, can you take on more work that has to do with burnout, even though you're already burnt out? Um, it's, it's a real challenge. And so trying to navigate that in a way that is both effective, but also respectful of people's time and bandwidth is a challenge. We're happy to take it on, but it is a challenge. Now on the topic of psychedelics, we just did a webinar on the fourth that was a very basic introduction by a medical doctor uh, and someone else with training in spiritual care to say, here is what the landscape looks like in the US for psychedelic medications. It had nothing to do with chaplaincy interventions, but it was a presentation for chaplains to better understand here is the state of psychedelic interventions in the United States. You mentioned psilocybin in, uh, in particular, and um, to my knowledge, that's still kind of the leading drug that is under study uh, that could be actually used in a healthcare context. At the end of March, we are partnering with uh, the organization Transforming Chaplaincy for a very specific webinar on here is how chaplains can become involved in this work. If you are a chaplain and you want to get involved in, you know, in places maybe where these types of studies are being done, or when, as these uh, interventions become legalized in healthcare settings more broadly, here's the type of training and information that chaplains need to have to be more effective in doing that. Um, I have an impression, and it's purely an impression, uh, but I have an impression that this is going to be an enormous growth field over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, as psychedelic uh, medications are better understood from a scientific and medical standpoint, they're going to in, enter the medical mainstream more and more. And so I think this is something that chaplains really need to be aware of. Uh, one of the, the most striking studies that the doctor from the fourth uh, mentioned was that for the people who, were, who had undergone this experience, they said it was among the top five, if not the most meaningful spiritual experience of their life to have this one time psychedelic intervention under the supervision of a doctor. Uh, if we see how powerful that can be uh, through the lens of spirituality, then of course, 
chaplains need to be right there. And so I know that it's a, it's a, it's a heavily loaded, it's, it has a lot of cultural complications, but I really encourage chaplains to keep an eye on that because this is, this is um, a growth field to be sure. Yeah, I think chaplains can be really effective partners and uh, like care partners to help uh, process these experiences, to integrate, to find meaning in the uh, richly symbolic uh, experience that whatever whatever these psychedelics might uh, induce, you know, I think it's a, a great potential for the work that we do and perhaps a sub-specialization certification for this kind of work that I think you're right is uh, going to be explosive in terms of growth and you know, potential for helping uh, people with depression and also uh, been watching a number of studies about uh, psilocybin and palliative care, as I said. So very interesting frontier. It's, it's also receiving a lot of attention in the veteran community in the United States. Um, and and I'm, not, I'm not offering a comment on why this intervention seems to be, is very necessary, uh, but in treating things like PTSD, in treating things like moral injury, which so many veterans suffer enormously with every day. All you have to do is look at the suicide statistics to understand that. Uh, but uh, this is certainly an area where psychedelics have proven to be enormously effective. And, and speaking personally, not on behalf of the lab, but I really want to see this, this type of therapy expand because I think it has a lot of potential to help people. Yeah. John Hayward, you have a question. Yeah, just first, I want to say thank you, Robert, for putting this together. This is excellent. And Michael, uh, your content is, is amazing. And it's intrigued me as the executive director just to see the response to this webinar of the amount of participants that are here and to take a look at your website and the content uh, that you offer. I'm just curious, what's your relationship and partnership with our U.S. strategic partners? We have, we're in a, a conglomerate together with our U.S. partners, the ACPE, APC, NACC, NAJC. Um, how, how are you working together with them? And is there a, an opportunity to, for us to kind of partner together on some things uh, in Canada here, Michael, with uh, the Innovation Lab? Absolutely. I think that, that one of the, the hallmark characteristics of the lab is our flexibility and willingness to partner with, with a great variety of people. Uh, if you go to the website, we have, three, we have three or four principles that we say partners must adhere to these. They're not complicated. It's things like everyone is welcome. Uh, <laughs> no discrimination. Uh, we value research. These principles are not hard to, uh, to uphold or at least to agree to. And so we're happy to, to partner within okay. those very loose constraints. When we first started, uh, one of our advisors gave us this metaphor that has turned out to be, to be accurate, um, despite maybe the, the, the decline of this, of this type of institution. But he said, you know, the lab is kind of like a shopping mall. Um, <laughs> you are the space where anybody can come. And some of the stores are bigger like APC, ACPE, what have you. Some of the stores are bigger and some of them are a lot smaller. So we have partnerships with the Association of Muslim Chaplains, uh, the North American uh, Hindu Chaplains Association. So some of those stores are smaller uh, and some people are so, it's such a small organization, all they have is a kiosk uh, and that's fine. We welcome everybody. We want anybody to come into the mall and say, look what there is. We're not favoring anybody. We're not saying you should go there or you shouldn't go there. Um, anybody can come in. Uh, and then we, if you really want to stretch that, that metaphor out, things like our webinars, our eBooks, all of that, it's kind of like the food court where there's something there that everybody can come take. Um, no matter who you are, there's going to be something there for you. Well, that's, that, that's excellent. And, and I'm and, just I'm just curious if maybe you and I could connect off offline, maybe meet sometime and, and have a conversation. That'd be excellent. Absolutely. More than happy to do so. OK, I'll reach out to you. Other questions? Now's your opportunity to connect uh, directly with Michael. Any questions, comments? Anyone else on the line? And I just want to say, um, I'm always available uh, for conversation to discuss. Uh, if, you can, if you can see my name here on Zoom, my email address is just mscags at brandice.edu. So you can always contact me. I'm happy to, to set up time to, to chat or send you resources or whatever is helpful.
And just looking through the list of uh, participants on the line today, I'm struck by the diversity that uh, that we have, the clinicians, clinical educators, uh, connections to uh, parish-based ministry, prison ministry. Uh, lovely to have John, our executive director on the line. Also presenters like David McGinley in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, author and uh, uh, presenter, all kinds of uh, networking possibilities and um, creative opportunities to connect with you and, and work together. Well, Last and, chair, sir. Well, go ahead. Yeah. I, just, I just wanted to, to say briefly uh, how much I appreciate the work that all of you are doing, both the association itself and then also the work of the individual chaplains. Um, I got my... I got my entry into the chaplaincy world, very long story, very complicated and very boring. Uh, but my entry into the world chaplains with chaplains working in seaports all around North America, uh, the North American Maritime Ministry Association, its, its executive director is in Canada. Uh, and there were a large number of, of uh, members that were in Canada. Um, but those chaplains are almost totally overlooked in the work that they do because seafarers are almost entirely overlooked in the work that they do. Uh, but I saw firsthand just how hard they work uh, without recognition, very little pay, with a lot of folks not even knowing what it is that they do. Uh, and so I saw firsthand how important that work is. And I really value the work that chaplains are doing. I really appreciate that. I don't know how many times, you know, I'll have I'll have just a, a, a really mundane sort of project oriented meeting with a chaplain about something. And we'll, we'll get done with the meeting and I'll realize they just chaplained me, they listened to me and they were doing this without me even knowing it, maybe without them even knowing it. Uh, and I'm always so grateful and impressed by the work that chaplains do, so thank you. That's wonderful. Kara, you have a question for Michael. You've got the, I have to give you the dreaded, you're muted warning, Kara. <laughs> Thank you. Um, at the risk of chaplaining you, which wasn't my intention. And maybe <laughs> I missed this at the beginning, how, how you've come to this project and, and how it is that you're not a chaplain and you are so incredibly well versed and understanding. So I, I would love to know a little bit of your story. Uh, really great mentors is how I have ended up doing this work. Um, my, uh, my PhD is in history uh, at the University of Notre Dame. And so while I was there, a gentleman came to give a, a presentation on uh, sort of the religious life of Canada in the 1960s, which is sort of my time frame. And so I went to that and we had lunch afterwards and he started talking about his work with this organization of port chaplains. Oh, okay, great, that's interesting. Uh, and then a few months later, a call went out that they were looking for a staff member that could work remotely. Um, and I thought, this is great. It's part-time work. I have capacity, um, and I'm not a clergy person, and this is a way that I can support pastoral work in the world, so sure, I'll apply, and so I started doing this, uh, and I did a lot of the communications work for that organization, a lot of the partnership, did a lot of travel around the country to meet various members, uh, and, and really got a feeling for chaplaincy that way. As part of that project, I met Wendy Cadge, the lab's founder, uh, and we did a project together on the relationship between uh, port chaplains and religious congregations, sort of supporting the work of port chaplains. Um, and one thing led to another, and we said, let's just found a lab. And so we founded a lab. And by having, uh, you know, Jason Zydema's mentorship, by having Wendy's mentorship, Trace Haythorn, uh, uh, a very powerful influence uh, in this trajectory. It's just been knowing the right people and being in the right place at the right time. Uh, and meeting with as many chaplains as I can and getting to know them. So it's all happenstance. A lot of, a lot of days I realize I have no idea how I got here, but I'm here and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. It's a, it's a really beautiful story. So thank you for all that you're doing and offering. A few minutes left. Uh, any other questions or comments for Michael? giving a little extra pause time because you know chaplains are so good at that just to invite some uh, invite some responses from people who might be a little hesitant or formulating a question but last chance okay 
Michael, I can say that you have inspired me today. And I really appreciate the time you spent with us and uh, you've energized me and, uh, and you know, presented so many creative ideas and the resources on your website is just so fantastic and all the work that you're doing. We just really appreciate you being with us and thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Let me reiterate, I'm available to all of you, to any of you. If you have a question, a need, whatever, reach out, I'm happy to talk. Very good, bye for now. All right, thank you all, have a great afternoon, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.